In North Carolina, a Marine's estranged wife disappears without a trace. With no body and little physical evidence, naval investigators struggle to determine her fate. The remains of a young woman are found burning near a rural South Carolina road. For five years, her identity and that of her killer remain a mystery. In Virginia, a sailor in the United States Navy is found murdered in a vacant lot. Investigators must look among his shipmates to find the killer. Violence is an inescapable reality of contemporary life. And Navy sailors and US Marines are not beyond its reach. When those who defend their country commit murder, it falls to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service to ensure that no one escapes military justice. Carolina's Camp Lejeune is one of America's largest training grounds for the U.S. Marine Corps. But even here, where honor and loyalty are virtues, betrayal and murder exist. On March 27, 1999, Marine Corps Sergeant Whitman Wallace reported his estranged wife, 25-year-old Tanya, missing to military police. Though he and Tanya were separated, their four-year-old daughter had been staying with him for a few days. Tanya was supposed to pick her up after she got off work the previous evening. But she never showed. Tanya's roommates hadn't seen her either, and they said that her vehicle was also missing. Whitman believed Tanya had run off with another man. The case was turned over to the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, or NCIS, an elite civilian federal law enforcement organization whose mission is to protect and serve the Navy and Marine Corps and their families. Special Agent Robert Bratton, who headed up the major case response team, began the investigation into Tanya Wallace's disappearance. There were some very real concerns about uh, a mother of a four-year-old child who was very close to her child leaving uh, without any uh, comment to the family that she was staying with at the time. A few hours after the missing persons report was filed, word came in that Tanya's abandoned car had been found. Security guards at a nearby store had noticed it sitting in the parking lot since early that morning. An examination of the vehicle's exterior revealed the presence of small traces of human blood on the door handle. Agents and military police quickly spread out and began scouring the area for any signs of the young mother. But hours of searching failed to produce any clues to the missing woman's whereabouts. The vehicle was impounded for a more detailed analysis. Agents had to consider that with an impending divorce, Tanya Wallace might have gone missing on purpose. Looking for answers, agents went to check out her apartment and interview her roommates. One confirmed that recently Tanya had begun dating another man, but he was in the Navy and was currently deployed overseas. Tanya had made no mention of plans to travel. And since ending her relationship with the abusive Whitman Wallace, nothing seemed to be troubling her. The roommate added that since her split with Wallace, Tanya had become upbeat and excited about the new life she had ahead of her. 
She was committed to her daughter's happiness. And her roommate could not believe that Tanya would simply abandon her four-year-old, leaving her estranged husband to raise her. Based on interviews of her girlfriend that she was living with, uh, the fact that she had never uh, left the child alone for any period of time, in fact, was uncomfortable leaving uh, her child with uh, the father for any extended periods of time. Uh, we relatively quickly ruled out the, the idea that she had probably left with somebody willingly. Before leaving, agents collected Tanya's toothbrush and a hairbrush for future DNA comparisons. Though agents remained hopeful that Tanya Wallace would turn up unharmed, all the signs were pointing to foul play. But so far, they had no physical proof that a crime had taken place. I appreciate you coming down to talk to me. Sergeant Whitman Wallace was brought in for questioning. He insisted he had nothing to do with Tanya's disappearance. Though they couldn't seem to make their marriage work, he still loved her and their four-year-old daughter. He said that on the night Tanya disappeared, he had been assigned to work desk duty from 11 p.m. until early the next morning. He said he never left his post. Agents contacted Wallace's assistant, who also worked that evening. He confirmed that Wallace began his shift at 11 o'clock. But 30 minutes later, Wallace asked him to watch his desk. Wallace said his wife hadn't shown up to pick up their daughter, and he needed to go back home and look after her until Tanya arrived. Wallace left and eventually returned two hours later. Agents realized that Sergeant Wallace had lied when he claimed he never left work that night. Now, they needed to find out what he was trying to hide. They turned to the only piece of physical evidence they had. A week after she was reported missing, NCIS Special Agent and Forensic Consultant Mike Maloney began examining Tanya's vehicle. As soon as we opened the door, it was obvious that there was a great deal of blood in the car. It couldn't be seen from the outside. The interior of the vehicle was, or, was very dark, uh, dark colored carpet, dark colored uh, seats and interior. But once we opened the door, it was apparent that there was blood. The carpet revealed a large blood stain, approximately 16 inches long and 13 inches wide. Examiners removed it for a more detailed analysis. The DNA profile of the blood found in the vehicle matched those generated from the samples collected from Tanya's residence. Hey, Bob. It was clear that something violent had happened to Tanya. But without a body, agents were unable to prove that she was dead. Special Agent Mike Maloney devised a blood volume analysis experiment that could provide them with that proof. We felt that we could show that she had lost so much blood in that vehicle that she couldn't possibly be alive. Agent Maloney first needed to determine how much blood it would take to create the same size stains as those left on the vehicle's carpet. They obtained carpet samples from the vehicle manufacturer and saturated them with human blood. Examiners determined that 1,850 milliliters of human blood, or nearly four pints, was necessary to create a similar size stain and that would be nearly half of Tanya Wallace's total blood volume. No one could have survived such severe bleeding without medical assistance. For agents, there was now no doubt that Tanya Wallace was dead. And they were equally convinced that her estranged husband 
Sergeant Whitman Wallace was responsible. But so far, they had no hard evidence to prove murder. With no body and only a blood-stained carpet to work with, forensic examiners of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service proved that missing 25-year-old Tanya Wallace was dead. And NCIS special agents believed her estranged husband, Marine Corps Sergeant Whitman Wallace, had killed her. But they lacked physical proof. And Wallace was no longer cooperating. Believing the suspect may have tried to throw away evidence of his guilt, agents began searching the dumpsters surrounding Wallace's barracks. But the trash had already been emptied. NCIS Special Agent Robert Bratton refused to give up. Though it seemed like a long shot, he contacted the area landfill where all of the trash from the Camp Lejeune dumpsters is brought. They can tell you where trash that's picked up and delivered that day or any particular day is within just a few feet. We asked them at that point to isolate the uh, trash that was delivered on Monday and Tuesday of that week. The Marines Chemical Biological Incidents Response Force located that spot and began sifting through the mountain of debris. After hours of searching, the team found and collected a large green military issue sweatshirt and some women's clothes. All of the items were covered with what appeared to be blood stains. DNA tests on the items of clothing showed that all of the blood had originated from Tanya Wallace. And for Special Agent Mike Maloney, it appeared that Tanya had been wearing the clothing at the time of her death, except for one item, the green sweatshirt. We were curious as to who the sweatshirt belonged to, though. The staining was on the outside of the sweatshirt and saturated to the inside, so we were fairly certain it wasn't something that Tanya was wearing the night that she was killed. We examined the neckband of the sweatshirt and also the armpits. And there was quite a bit of uh, debris, of uh, old skin cells, of sweat and sweat saturation. Examiners were able to extract minute traces of DNA from the skin cells found on the sweatshirt. Analysis showed that the DNA was consistent with having come from Sergeant Whitman Wallace. Believing they were closing in on Tanya's killer, agents searched Wallace's barracks room. Wallace was in the process of moving out, and the place had been thoroughly cleaned. I don't know what the turn out to be. When agents applied luminol and darkened the room, large stains emerged on the tile floor. Right? Yeah. Tests confirmed that the blood was human. But the stain stopped abruptly where the carpet began. No blood was present beyond the tile flooring. Convinced Tanya had been murdered inside Whitman Wallace's barracks room, agents began interviewing other Marines who lived in the same complex. Thanks. What do you have for me? One Marine recalled that a few days after Tanya was reported missing, Wallace paid him a visit. And uh, it's probably it's probably no big deal. Appreciate it, man. You don't have to appreciate this. He said that he had an inspection coming up, and the carpet in his room was muddy, and it would never pass. Wallace asked to switch the carpets, and the barracks maid agreed. But after the inspection was complete, Wallace never returned to switch the rugs back. Appreciate it. Look, I'll give you a call, all right? All right, later on, okay. In fact, it was still lying on the Marine's floor. You have his rug now? Yeah. Hoping the rug contained the evidence they needed to prove Whitman Wallace was a killer, agents collected it and brought it to the lab for testing. 
Agent Maloney examined the carpet. We did the luminol test, and we found the rest of the missing pattern from that stain by the door. They matched together perfectly, just like a puzzle piece, a very large saturation stain of what was later positively identified as blood on the carpet that matched that pattern that had been so sharply cut off on the tile floor. DNA testing revealed that the blood on the rug, as well as the blood on the tile floor, was consistent with Tanya's. Agents now had enough evidence to make their case. Sergeant Whitman Wallace was placed under arrest and charged with murder. Based on the evidence, agents believed that Whitman Wallace was unwilling to give up custody of his daughter and was resentful of having to pay child support. On March 26, 1999, after getting off work, Tanya went to her estranged husband's barracks to pick up her daughter. Whitman Wallace had made sure he would be there when she arrived. With the couple's four-year-old daughter asleep in the next room, Wallace savagely beat Tanya to death. He put her bleeding body into her vehicle, drove to a remote site, and buried her. At a general court-martial, Sergeant Whitman Wallace pled guilty to kidnapping and unpremeditated murder. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. And as part of the plea agreement, Wallace led authorities to Tanya's remains. Even without the victim's body, NCIS special agents were able to quickly expose the deadly violence of a Marine Corps sergeant. But in South Carolina, it would take naval investigators years to unravel one killer's deadly scheme. On November 6, 1989, a man driving along an isolated road in Jasper County, South Carolina, noticed something burning on the side of the road. Fearing it could spark a larger fire, he went to extinguish it. The fire was emanating from a large green duffel bag. And inside the bag, the man saw what appeared to be the charred remains of a human body. He called 911. Deputies from the Jasper County Sheriff's Office raced to the scene. The person found inside the duffel bag was burned beyond recognition. And the skull had been smashed. The only clue to the victim's identity was a unicorn print nightgown that had survived the blaze, indicating this person was likely female. According to Jasper County Detective Sam Woodward, investigators found little else. The only thing we had was a, a female body in a duffel bag that was set afire. Um, basically, that's all we had. We didn't have no footprints, uh, no tire tracks, nothing like that. Believing that the victim's identity would reveal her killer, police hoped an autopsy would yield valuable information. Analysis of the remains led the medical examiner to conclude that the female victim was Caucasian, around 25 years old, with dark brown hair. An enlarged uterus indicated that she had recently given birth. Her death had been brutal. She had been hit in the head 32 times with a blunt instrument. Police entered what little information they had into a national law enforcement database containing descriptions of missing persons. They also checked all local missing persons reports. But none of the reports matched the description of this Jane Doe. Authorities knew their only hope of identifying this victim was to reconstruct her face as it had been in life. For help, 
police called upon the expertise of Dr. Ted Rathbun, professor of anthropology at the University of South Carolina. He quickly realized this task would not be easy. In a complete human skull, there are 22 separate bones of the skull and face. But in this instance, due to the massive trauma, there were at least 122 fragments to deal with. Some as large as the palm of your hand, others as small as half of your little fingernail. So that it really was a jigsaw puzzle, a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. After eight days, Dr. Rathbun had successfully rebuilt the skull. I was able to provide law enforcement and the forensic artists with a completed skull that was held together with glue, with uh, supporting sticks and clay, uh, so that photographs could be taken and oriented, uh, representing an individual with a distinctive facial structure. Okay. Forensic artist Roy Paschal of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division was brought in. It was now up to him to bring this victim to life. Uh, we do have that hybrid. After placing rubber markers at certain points in the skull to indicate the depth of the flesh, Pascal photographed the evidence. Then he began drawing the face of the victim by hand in pencil. Four months after her body was found, Jane Doe finally had a face. Hoping to spark some recognition from the public, the victim's image was distributed throughout the area to the media and to local law enforcement agencies. But no leads were developed. Five years went by without a break in the investigation. It began to look as if this case would never be solved. For investigators, it seemed that the identity of Jane Doe and that of her killer would remain a mystery. For nearly five years, a female victim found burning along a Jasper County, South Carolina road remained unidentified. Although forensic examiners had given Jane Doe a face, her name and the circumstances surrounding her death remained a mystery. Go one time. Years of searching through missing persons reports failed to produce a match. It's just one of those things, just... And by 1993, missing persons cases filed in South Carolina had reached an all-time high. But the rash of reported cases was not limited to the civilian population. Agents from the Naval Criminal Investigative Service stationed in Charleston were also inundated with similar cases involving military personnel and members of their families. Though they had formed a cold case squad to deal with the volume, their caseload continued to increase. In October of 1993, agents responded to the home of Kathy French. Her lifelong friend, 28-year-old Annie Tahan, hadn't been heard from in nearly five years. At the time of her disappearance, Annie had been living with her boyfriend, Michael Pallon, a sailor stationed in Charleston. And though Annie and Michael had had a child together in 1989, their relationship had been troubled. Just after Annie became pregnant, Michael grew violent and abusive toward her. He would explode into a rage for no particular reason and threaten to leave her and take their baby with him. Annie began to fear for her life, but she vowed she would never give up her child. A short while later, Kathy moved out of state. And after giving birth to her baby, Annie wanted to join her 
but was reluctant because Michael Pallan had had her arrested once before on bogus kidnapping charges. A few months later, Annie called her. She was ready to leave Charleston with her baby and come stay with Kathy. Kathy said she wired Annie money for bus fare, but never heard from her again. Since the father of the missing woman's child was a sailor in the United States Navy, NCIS Special Agent Jim Grebus agreed to open an investigation. But given the couple's tumultuous relationship, he had to consider that Annie's disappearance had been intentional. Uh, we felt that maybe she um, was in a bad relationship with Michael Pallon and that she could have just fled. And um, that, that was a possibility we had to rule out. A records check showed that electronics warfare okay, chief Michael Pallon was currently stationed at a naval base in Hawaii. Agent Grievous contacted agents there and asked them to speak with Pallon. Michael Pallon told the agents that on the morning of November 6, 1989, he woke to find that Annie had left him and the baby. He remembered that she'd called a few days later, but didn't say where she was or what her plans were. He hadn't heard from her since. Pallon added that his mother, who currently lived in Savannah, Georgia, had since adopted their daughter. Naval investigators didn't believe Pallon's story. For them, there was only one explanation as to why Annie Tahan was not with her baby. We felt that if she was going to leave, what she wanted to do, she would have taken that child. That was the one thing she wanted was to take that child with her. She did not want to lose that child. It didn't take uh, us very long to form the opinion that she had, uh, she had been um, murdered. Agents believe that Michael Pallan had killed Annie Tahan. But so far, they had no proof. They began reviewing dozens of unsolved murder cases from throughout the state. In one of the files, dating back to 1989, Agent Grievous made a startling discovery. That was a forensic a drawing of a young lady that had been found in Jasper County on November 6th of 1989. And I took this photograph I had of Annie, and I, I looked at both of them, and I knew right then that this was Annie and that we had just found her. DNA analysis confirmed that the mysterious Jane Doe was in fact Annie Tahan. And now, Naval Chief Michael Pallan was the prime suspect in her murder investigation. Right, I went up to sled yesterday and I met with him. But NCIS Special Agent Peter Hughes knew that finding proof of his guilt would be difficult. The problem we were confronted with was the fact that we were working a homicide case six years after the fact. So to um, start from ground zero and try and put these facts together was going to be a tremendous hurdle for all of us. Results for the credit card. Agents and local authorities began by trying to retrace Pallan's movements at the time of the murder. In Hardyville. They sifted through his phone records for November 6, 1989. They found several calls placed to a number in Savannah, Georgia, located 100 miles away. The number belonged to Pallan's ex-wife. Unsure of the connection, local police obtained her financial records. They found a receipt dated November 6th from a gas station located 25 miles from where Annie's body was discovered. Investigators began to theorize that Michael Pallan had not acted alone. Agents traveled to Miami, where Pallan's ex-wife currently lived. Though she denied any knowledge of Annie's murder, she remembered that one morning in mid-November 1989, Pallan called her. He said that Annie had recently left him and he needed her to help take care of the baby. She agreed and drove to Pallan's apartment in Charleston a day or two later to pick up the child. 
but the phone records and gas receipts proved that she had traveled to the apartment on November 6th, the same day Annie was murdered. When it came to dates and times, she couldn't seem to keep her story straight. Agents confronted her with the receipts and asked if they would help refresh her memory. Once she realized we knew she was in that apartment uh, at about the time that Annie was murdered, um, she knew we had her. Knowing she could be implicated in the murder, the ex-wife agreed to cooperate. She said that Michael Pallon didn't want Annie in his life anymore, but wanted the couple's baby. Knowing Annie would never give up her child, Pallon plotted to kill her. And the ex-wife agreed to help him pull it off. In the early morning hours of November 6th, Pallon called her and told her it was done and he needed her help in cleaning up the apartment. When she arrived just after dawn, she noticed blood everywhere. After helping Pallon load Annie's body into the trunk of his car, she helped him shampoo the carpets and paint over the blood spatter on the walls. The information had brought agents one step closer to making their case. Now they needed to find physical proof that Michael Pallon had done what his ex-wife had accused him of. She agreed to take agents to Pallon's old apartment and walk them through the crime scene. Though the apartment was now vacant, the ex-wife was able to point out where Annie's body had been on the carpet. She also described the pattern of blood spatter on the walls and ceiling. But no blood was visible. And after so many years, agents were skeptical they would find any. Still, agents darkened the room and applied luminol throughout the area. To their surprise, blood was still present. And the locations of all the stains were exactly where the ex-wife said they would be. Though the findings had corroborated the ex-wife's statements and provided powerful evidence of Pallon's guilt, agents knew it didn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was the killer. Because when you look at the facts of the case, a defense attorney can easily say that this was a jealous wife who killed her, not Pallon, but a jealous wife. Agents needed to get Michael Pallon to confess to the murder. With the ex-wife's help, agents set a trap. She would phone Pallon and coax him into talking about the murders. Interesting enough, the opening comment that his ex-wife made was, uh, Michael, they found the body. They found Annie. And his reply was, no, they didn't, which um, was, was of major significance in that he, an innocent person, of course, is going to say, what are you talking about, body? I don't know, what, what are you talking about? But now he's, he's on the phone and he's telling us, no, the police didn't find the body. Got him to talk about after several days of intercepting phone calls, agents had heard enough. Well, did you hear him deny? Tell him. Three weeks before he was scheduled to retire from the Navy, Chief Michael Pallon was placed under arrest and charged with the murder of Annie Tahan. Confronted with the evidence amassed against him, Pallon confessed to the crime. Determined to keep his child, he said in the early morning hours of November 6th, he returned home from work to find Annie sleeping in front of the TV. Using a blunt instrument, he beat her to death. To conceal his guilt, he placed Annie's body in a duffel bag and drove to a deserted country road. 
he threw gasoline on the body and lit it on fire. At a general court-martial convened at the Naval Station in Mayport, Florida, Michael Pallan pled guilty to the premeditated murder of Annie Tahan. He was sentenced to 30 years at the Leavenworth Federal Prison. We asked for comparisons. Betrayal by a husband or a wife has become all too common. This, this is our girl or somewhere along the way. But military buddies claim to be loyal friends to the end. Much in the eyes. On the morning of April 23rd, 1998, a man pulling up weeds near an apartment complex in Newport News, Virginia, noticed something lying in the grass. When he approached, he saw that it was a human body, and the male victim had been shot to death. The man went to a nearby apartment and called 911. Officers from the Newport News Police Department responded to the scene. They began searching the victim's pockets for any clues to his identity. Inside a wallet, they found several hundred dollars in cash and an ID card. The victim was 23-year-old Stephen November, a sailor stationed aboard an aircraft carrier at the nearby Norfolk Naval Base. He had been shot five times. But the lack of any stray bullets or shell casings at the scene, combined with scuff marks observed on the victim's shoes, led police to believe that Stephen November had been murdered elsewhere, then brought to this remote location. No one who lived in the area had seen or heard anything unusual. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the cause of death was a 9mm gunshot wound to the victim's head. Four other bullets, recovered from November's head and chest, appear to have been fired from the same weapon. But with few clues and no solid suspects, police knew that finding this young sailor's killer would be a difficult challenge. Police in Newport News, Virginia, continued searching for answers in the shooting death of 23-year-old Stephen November an enlisted sailor in the United States Navy. With little physical evidence to go on, police hoped a search of his residence would yield some clues. Police scoured November's records. One document caught their attention. It was a transaction record in Stephen November's name for a 9mm handgun the same type of gun that had been used to kill him. Keep looking, but, but a thorough search of the apartment failed to produce the weapon. Looking to uncover any information, detectives contacted the victim's commanding officers at the Norfolk Naval Base. But nothing in November's records suggested any problems. He was a dedicated sailor and was well liked by his shipmates. Hoping to retrace November's movements on the night he was murdered, detectives arranged to interview his friends and shipmates. Airman apprentice Hector Coleman said he and another friend were with November the night before his body was discovered. The three had gone out to run a few errands that evening. Around 10 o'clock, November asked the driver, Carlos Saldana, to drop him off at a nearby convenience store. November said he had some things to do, and he would meet up with them later. He had just cashed a large tax refund check and was carrying over $2,000 in cash. Yeah. 
the two men watched November enter the store and then drove away. Cool guy. I mean, cool guy. Coleman said they never saw their friend after that. Airman recruit Carlos Saldana, who had been driving the car that night, was also interviewed. He told the same story as Hector Coleman. But almost immediately, police sensed that Saldana was not telling the truth. Newport News homicide detective Lorenzo Shepard observed the questioning. Uh, while he was being questioned, he was, appeared to be very nervous. Uh, he was very fidgety. Uh, he wouldn't look you directly in the eye. And those normally are, sound, are signs of individuals who are being deceptive or not being truthful uh, when discussing something. Sure. Detectives asked Saldana to take a polygraph test. When the results indicated deception, he decided to talk. Saldana said the three had gone to the convenience store that night, but they did not leave after November went inside. The victim got into the back seat of the car a few minutes later, and they drove away. He said Hector Coleman then pulled out a 9mm gun and shot Stephen November. The motive behind the murder, according to Saldana, was robbery. Saldana had no idea where the murder weapon currently was, but he knew that the gun belonged to Stephen November. Carlos Saldana and Hector Coleman were both placed under arrest and charged with murder. Coleman denied any involvement in the shooting. With Saldana's confession, Police believed they had an airtight case. But a month before the case was scheduled to go to trial, an inmate serving time with Saldana in the city jail came forward with information. I've already been here for three months. I don't, uh, everybody. Carlos Saldana had bragged that he was the one who actually murdered Stephen November. He told the inmate that he had pinned it on Hector Coleman in order to avoid the death penalty. The inmate had provided reliable information in the past, and police had no reason to doubt him now. Investigator's strongest witness had confessed to being the trigger man. And now, a month before the trial, they were back to square one. Investigators knew that one of the two men in custody was responsible for Stephen November's murder. But until they could prove who had pulled the trigger, they knew they could never win a conviction. Police in Newport News, Virginia, had two enlisted men in custody for the murder of Stephen November, a 23-year-old Navy sailor found shot to death in a vacant lot. Though Carlos Saldana told police that his friend Hector Coleman was the killer, Saldana later admitted to an inmate that he had actually pulled the trigger. With the trial just weeks away, investigators were now in danger of losing their case. But they had another option, one that would allow investigators more time to build a solid case. Newport News authorities dropped all of the charges against Hector Coleman and Carlos Saldana and turned the case over to prosecutors of the Navy's Judge Advocate General Corps, referred to as JAG, who shared jurisdiction in the investigation. JAG officer Lieutenant Commander Scott Lang took the case. And with little physical evidence, he had to prove which of the two witnesses was telling the truth. The challenges in this case were that we had only two witnesses, and both of them had a huge motive to lie. Uh, no one wants to get pinned with being the actual trigger man in a murder. So we did not want to commit our prosecutorial efforts to any one theory uh, based solely on the word of someone with a motive to lie. For help, Lieutenant Commander Lang turned to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service located in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, I just want to go Give everybody a brief here. Agent Bill Heath was assigned the case. 
His first step was to determine the truthfulness of Carlos Saldana's claim that Hector Coleman committed the murder inside his vehicle. We wanted to go back to that vehicle and determine the feasibility of Mr. Saldana's statement. Could this shooting have occurred in this vehicle as he described? That was, that was their primary objective. Is it possible? An initial inspection of the vehicle, however, revealed no visible traces of blood or any other signs of violence. The search of Saldana's vehicle was turning up nothing. And it seemed that agent's best chance of exposing Stephen November's killer was slipping away. But NCIS forensic examiners are trained to look past the obvious. Special Agent Mike Maloney removed the rear seat of the vehicle where Stephen November had allegedly been sitting when the murder occurred. When he split the seat cushions open, he found the underlying foam cushion soaked in blood. DNA analysis confirmed that the blood stains had come from Stephen November's body. Using a projectile trajectory analysis, Agent Maloney now set out to prove where the shots had come from. Projectile trajectory analysis is a method by which you take the injuries or the wounds that occur to the individual and also any intermediate targets that the bullet may have passed through, be it the clothing, be it the seat itself, um, a wall, a window, and by lining those up you're able to determine where the likely point of origin of that shot was. A mannequin with Stephen November's bullet-ridden shirt was placed in the back seat of Saldana's car. Using the blood stains in the seat cushion to approximate the victim's position, Agent Maloney concluded that the path of the bullets must have originated from the front passenger seat. Since Carlos Saldana was known to be the driver the night of the murder, agents could assume that Hector Coleman had occupied the front passenger seat position. But for Special Agent Heath, that was not enough. He needed to locate the murder weapon, which he believed was Stephen November's missing 9mm gun. A short while after entering the serial number into a national law enforcement database, he got a call. Police in Brooklyn, New York had arrested a man on a burglary charge, and in his possession, was Stephen November's 9mm handgun. When the gun was recovered, I was uh, extremely happy that, that we had found that proverbial needle in a haystack. The next hurdle was determining, is this the murder weapon or not? After ballistics tests confirmed that November's gun had fired the fatal shots, Agent Heath traveled to New York to find out how the gun got there. The man in custody claimed he bought the gun from a friend of his. Reluctantly, he provided agents with the name and number of the seller. Agents contacted the man who had sold the gun. Fearing for his own safety, he agreed to talk, but only in a secluded spot at a nearby park. When shown photographs of the suspects, he pointed to Hector Coleman an old childhood friend as the man who sold him the 9mm gun. Coleman told his friend that he had used the gun to commit a murder, and now he needed to get rid of it. Once I was able to locate the witness in New York that actually purchased this 9mm from Mr. Coleman, his testimony became absolutely tremendous because here we have a disinterested third party who, in a casual conversation with Mr. Coleman, was given all the details of the crime. Though agents have no idea why Carlos Saldana had bragged to an inmate that he had pulled the trigger, they had proven that Hector Coleman had murdered Stephen November. Agents believe that before entering the convenience store, November asked his friend Hector Coleman to hold on to his 9mm gun. After driving away, Coleman said he wanted to fire the gun into the air. He asked November to make sure there were no police around. 
when the young sailor turned his back, Coleman shot him. He then robbed him of nearly $2,000 in tax refund money. Then had Saldana drive to a remote location where they dumped the victim. Saldana later claimed that Coleman threatened to kill him too if he told anyone about the murder. Carlos Saldana pled guilty to one count of accessory and two counts of false official statements. He was sentenced to eight years confinement. A general court-martial was convened for Hector Coleman on August 18, 1999. He was found guilty of the robbery and murder of Stephen November. He was sentenced to life without parole in a federal prison. Violent crime poses a threat to every segment of society. But when a murder occurs within the United States Navy and Marine Corps, it falls to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service to make certain that no one escapes military justice.